Hello, I'm back. I wonder if people can hear me. I wonder whether it's Ravinda's problem. Okay, let's try again. Thank you for persisting, people. Whoever I saw there, I don't know what these two are doing. Anyway, I, I can hear you a bit better now. Hopefully, the sound is better for everyone else. It wasn't me. They're telling me it's you. Thank God, it's someone else's fault. Um, <laughs> right. So, how many of these recipes are from your restaurant, and how many are completely original? Um, there's a lot of original stuff. I'd say maybe thirty to forty percent are from the restaurant, and you know we we are inventing all the time. We're developing dishes all of the time, so um, you know things creep in and out, or you might get a version of something that's been at the restaurant. Um, but there are there are some classics such as the prawn toast scotch egg, which everyone loves. The banana cake with miso butter scotch. Those are all in there. I kept, I put the classics in because people have been asking for those recipes for a long time. God, yeah, I haven't eaten, so I'm getting really hungry thinking about all of this. You should have sent me some food, but you did send me some lovely food from Comfort and Joy, which has been the the vegetarian yeah. thing you've been doing. Um, yeah. I've noticed that you you say in the book that you your diet is mainly vegetarian now why is that and um can you see yourself going fully vegetarian um no i don't don't think i will go fully vegetarian but actually my diet has always been um quite vegetarian i was vegetarian for 10 years as well but just generally coming from the background that i do i had a very so there's a grandmother who i've written about quite a lot who was this kind of very kind of puritanical, you must not eat meat, these are saints days and you can't eat meat on certain days and you know, all of this kind of scaremongering. And, you know, I've put, I, in fact, I was reading that earlier today and, you know, my, my father was an absolute staunch carnivore. And so she'd be like, right, on Tuesdays and Sundays, you can't eat meat. And so he would, you know, he'd go out and he'd have his like nyama choma and, and, and whiskey dinner. And she could smell ripe animal odor from like 50 paces. So he'd always get busted. But we, we just generally ate really delicious vegetarian food. So it's just how I've naturally grown up eating meat is for special occasions or, you know, once in a while a treat if I feel like it. But, but I'm not really drawn to lots of meat, although there are a lot of meat recipes in, in the book because at Jikoni we cook everything. Yeah, and some some of your meat dishes are the one of my favorite things. I mean, your your scotch eggs are incredible. Um, I was really uh, struck by your father, uh, you know, your late father, right? Sorry, um, and yeah. he uh, how he couldn't control his appetite, and I can really yeah. relate to that. I mean, whenever I go to your restaurant, I just basically eat until I'm about to explode, and I I feel <laughs> that generally with Indian food, I can't control what I eat. How do you control what you eat? And do you think we have an issue, I mean, given in the current environment with, you know, black and Asian people suffering from obesity and so on? Um, what do you think about that? You know, when I think about my father and his, um, his eating addiction, I think it was actually linked to something deeper. He was just not the kind of person who showed stress. But I, I imagine that come to a new country and pretty much start over must have been incredibly stressful and the kind of families that we came from you weren't just supporting your nuclear family you were also responsible and he was the eldest son for the rest of his brothers and sisters and you know family um and that must have been really a heavy uh, burden to carry on on your shoulders and, you know, his mother, because he was the eldest, she was very sort of strict and stern with him. And there wasn't a lot of that kind of loving, you know, cajoling relationship between a mother and son. So I think he sought that comfort and love in, in food. And I, I can relate to that because I'm a comfort eater. If I'm feeling depressed, I want to reach for the, the ice cream or um, whatever it might be. Um, but I think, you know, I just, you know, I don't know whether it's generally across 
Asian people, I think in increasingly people are more and more into their fitness. I mean, I when I go to India, I'm shocked at how guys are like gymming it and like, uh, you know, just just so conscious of the way they look. But certainly we've got uh, underlying conditions to worry about, like diabetes and all of these things, heart disease. Um, but I think people are more educated now. They're making more educated choices and maybe things aren't the same as they used to be. Yeah, and uh, I, but you, you talk about fried food in the book and how frying something makes it instantly, instantly delicious, which is true. Yeah. And a lot of, lot of Punjabi food is fried, isn't it? Yeah, so you have this karai, and I think I fry in particular, so it's a, the, my mom, and I, I remember this cast iron karai coming out. Out and you know, they come out of it from samosas to like bhajia, these fish bhajias, which were so delicious. And it became a very social thing, and people would sort of gather around this karai and sort of eat morsels like baby birds straight out of the pan. Um, but yeah, I, I think I've said something like uh, deep frying is like the icing sugar of cookery, it just makes everything taste better. Yeah, so how, do you restrict yourself on what you eat uh, in terms of fried food? I've never I actually think, seen you eat, I think. I, yeah, I eat plenty. Um, but, you know, obviously everything in, in, in moderation, you're not going to, um, you know, I can't, for example, just eat heavy meals all the time because I have to be quite light-footed and, and quite physically, um, you know, my stamina has to be, uh, when I'm doing a full day in the restaurant, I need to be light on my feet and be able to move around the kitchen. So I can't indulge in huge heavy meals. This is why I think comfort and joy is the kind of food I really enjoy, you know, because it's light, it's nourishing. And it's not about taking fat out or taking the sugars out. I think everything in moderation, but your food should feel nurturing. And then it's, it's also about your, um, your relationship with the food that you're eating. I mean, you know, you look at the French and they just have this kind of George de Viva and they just enjoy everything. Everything, butter and cream and all of that. If I think the the rates of heart disease in France are actually quite low, and people don't tend to get very fat. Um, but I think it's your attitude to eating and and how you eat it and how mindful you are about what you're eating. You talk a bit about the thing I'm writing about. Mom, I'm writing a book about British Empire, and you talk a bit of about the you know the Anglo Indian food that was created out of empires of stuff like kedgeri, which I agree with you, I've never liked. But you, you yeah. make some fish cakes, which are slightly inspired by kedgeri, right? So um, what do you make of that Anglo-Indian heritage that we've inherited as a country? Um, you know, I haven't really been able to relate to a lot of that stuff. It seems very that I think of as Indian or the kind of thing that my mum cooks. Um, so I haven't been able to relate to a lot of uh, things like chicken tikka masala. I didn't grow up eating that. I ha we didn't have that in Kenya. Um, so I haven't really been able to engage with it in, in that way. Is there anything you like from that era? I mean, there's stuff like turtle soup, mock turtle soup, I guess. Um, is there any, any of those old dishes that are served up in these old gentlemen's clubs that you like? Uh... I think, you know, what I did have when I was traveling in uh, South India was I went to the Uti Club and I had Mulligatani. And that was actually super delicious, really peppery soup. And, you know, everyone had to dress up for dinner. And I quite liked that, you know. But, uh, but yeah, there are certain things that just get stuck in your throat because you know the history that, that came, you know, how these things came about. And it makes me a little sad. But I love the um, I love the stories and the etymology behind some of the dishes. Like we have moili at the restaurant, which is one of our. I think you've eaten that. One of the signature dishes is the prawn moili, with, which is like a South Indian coconut curry. And apparently, the word moili came from. Um, apparently, during the Raj, there was this British colonel who went to South India with his wife, who couldn't stand the heat of the spices. So she had this idea of tempering the um, spicy food with coconut milk. 
and her name was Molly. And over the years, it's obviously yeah. min- mispronounced and it's become Moily. So it's mean Moily. Mean is fish, and Moily is to Molly. <laughs> oh, I love stories like that. I was going to ask you what your relationship was with English food when you were growing up. I mean, you came to London when you were quite young. Um, when I was growing up in Wolverhampton, we grew up on Punjabi food. My mum making these amazing vegetable curries, which we would push aside in a second if we had a sniff of McDonald's or a frozen pizza. And it's only in later in life I've grown to appreciate, um, you know, my mum's cooking. Um, what was your relationship with English food? I noticed that one of your recipes is for a lamb and barat sausage roll is that sounds delicious yeah they're delicious um the, my relationship was a funny one because before i moved here you know we were living this like very sort of charmed life in kenya and we would make frequent trips to london and it was this wonderland of like hamleys and like you know wonderful things very different to when we had to actually move here um but i sort of uh thought about english food in this very exotic fond way you know i could almost get teary eyed thinking about yorkshire puddings and like sausages english sausages and you know all that kind of stuff seemed really exotic to me and then when we moved to this country you know there were all these adverts for things like finder's crispy pancakes and like um you know all these kinds of weird and wonderful dishes you know fray bento's pies and things like that which actually i'm still very deeply suspicious of because they look like they're they've been served in a dog bowl or something like something your dog would eat out of but um i know some people love them and that's fine but um my mom just never would allow us to have anything like that in the house and i think part of it was her she was sort of very jealous about the way we ate she didn't like us eating out she didn't like us liking other people's food her food was the best and if we ever said something was nice she was like out to prove that she could do a better version of it so i like what i find interesting is my dad's relationship with english food so you know he in the 70s and he was studying and everything so he had these sort of really cute um nostalgic memories and like liking of eating things like he used to love eating gammon with pineapple <laughs> so with a pineapple ring jam so as- jam and pineapple or ham no gammon with pineapple so oh gammon, gammon. oh yeah yes with very pineapple. 70s yeah. very 70s and so of course my mother was like Yes, but I can do it better. So she would like get you know a ham and she would cover it in ginger and garlic and chilies and and pineapple juice. So there's actually a dish in the book inspired by that memory. The the, the bacon that we make at a restaurant, which everyone loves, is inspired by that memory of my dad eating you know ham and pie. and um, yeah, I just uh, I just I was just never allowed to. I always kind of wanted to try it, but was never allowed because she always made a version. And the other thing that was funny is that she would cook all these extravagant meals, you know, hard meals like you know making dals and sabzis and all of this. And then on Friday night, she'd be like, "It's my night off. It's English food night." Except she would cook everything from scratch. So she would do like fish and chips, but you know, with spices through the batter and everything. It was her night off. Yes, we used to have similar things like really spicy baked beans and um, tandoori turkey. Um, another great thing about this book is, you know, it's got so many quotes from so many famous people who love you. Sam Rushdie on the front, Otto Lenghi. You know, if you, if we follow you on Twitter, you know, you've got masses of other chefs who love your work. Nigel Slater, Nigella Lawson, who I know you've cooked for. So, what's it like cooking for people like that in your restaurant? Oh, uh, you know, it's just um it's just been a gift. I mean, someone said to me, "What, you know, what have been your pinch me moments?" And I think they have been those things like cooking for those incredible people who you've looked up to, you know, people like Nigella who actually if I hadn't read how to eat when I was ha- had my Saturday job at, at Selfridges and I bought how to eat and I just completely fell in love with her sort of luminous writing. and then you know watched her in 1999 on uh, you know how to be a domestic goddess or whatever that show was nightella bites 
I just was completely enamored with her. She was not only my girl crush, but she was this very intelligent, very eloquent, and who just made you want to run to the kitchen and have your way with whatever was languishing in the back of the fridge. Um, so, you know, they were huge inspirations and to be able to cook for them and, and people like Yotam, who just really has paved the way forward for using all these interesting uh, ingredients and, and giving recognition to people. And that kind of mixed heritage food. Um, I mean, that been wonderful but I think some of the really lovely sort of pinch me moments I have are also when I finish a third I'd always visualize this and now here it is in the flesh the sound is getting very laggy again sorry about that um I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask people to send in some questions I'm gonna speak slowly in the hope that we recover a sound um my final question to you is um very controversial one. Can Indians make puddings? I genuinely believe Indian cuisine is the best cuisine in the world. Full stop. It's one. That's not for debate. But I don't think you're very good at puddings. But your pudding, your, am I remember this right? You made an apple jalebi once. So delicious. Yeah. Um, Yeah, apple jalebi, yeah. It's been so popular. I mean, I, I actually don't agree with you. I think Indians are great at making puddings. And I think we know so much about biryanis and this and that and the other. But there's this kind of milky veil over what is Indian patisserie. And it's being lost and it needs to be revived and it needs to be preserved. I, for, for one, would love to go and do some work with halvais in India. You know, the really people who know how to make these things. It's such a tradition. And it makes me really sad that now when you go to the metros like Bombay, and Delhi and places like that, and um, that, you know, people are buying Thornton's chocolate over buying Mitai it breaks my heart slightly because this is a tradition that, that's being lost and needs to be kept alive. So I do think that it's a very, very specialist thing. I don't think it's always um, palatable to a European taste because it can be very, very sweet. But equally, if you have a good uh, you know, Indian halvai, you can have really delicate flavors as well. And it's just about finding a good one. But yeah, I love that kind of interplay of uh, taking very classic things like an apple fritter or a or jalebi recipe and turning it into something new. Wow, God. And your mango donuts, that was, those sound amazing. Uh, which is one of my favorite um, Your sound is back, which is good news. With um, I'm going to start asking some of the questions and, that people uh, are putting to you. And one of the questions we've had is, what, which dish conjures up your fondest memory? And now, and now you've got laggy again. Sorry, yeah. Which dish? Yeah, sorry. I'll, sorry. I'm going to ask people to send in some questions as well. But which dish conjures up your fondest sorry, memory? Sorry, repeat that, Satnam. You... I can. Rose. Can you hear me now? Can you... Always terrified of going anywhere near it. Uh, but actually, I am, um, yeah, dal. Actually, the dal cooking, the steam that built up in the kitchen, I, that takes me back to my mother's cooking. Oh God, it's making me very melancholic because I've not I've not smelled my mum's mom, cooking in about five months because of bloody bloody lockdown. Um, someone else has asked, uh, which is your favourite ingredient? I don't know if you're allowed to have a favourite ingredient as a chef. It's very difficult, but I think um, one of the things that I really love is fresh curry leaves. When you pop them in oil, the scent that you get out of them is like there is nothing else that can give you that flavor or that scent. There are no alternatives for fresh curry leaves. I can't say, oh, well, it's a bit like this or try that. 
They are completely and utterly unique, and I love that about them. Uh, I'm going to ask people to keep sending on qu sending questions. I was going to ask you, how do you feel about TV? Because you do a bit of TV work, don't you? But um, have you chosen to do more or less, or how do you feel like it interacts with your writing and what you do in a restaurant? You know, I think that um, I have to be very active and I like to do, um, keep doing things. And sometimes with television, there's a lot of standing around waiting for shots to particularly in cookery. I don't know how you found it, but especially in cookery, there'll be a lot of, okay, we need to crack that egg again and we need to get it from this angle and that angle. And you need to say that five times and, you know, give us five different versions, give us the long and the short and I find that a little bit tedious sometimes. Obviously, television is great for a profile if you're, you know, written a book and you want to promote that book. Or it's that's great, and I don't turn my nose up at that. Um, but I don't know if I'm a natural, naturally uh, telegenic person. Are you? I think you are telegenic, but you're right. I think uh, I think there's a famous line that 90% of TV is waiting around like war. And I, I, I can genuinely relate to that. Um, of the things you do, like the writing, the running a restaurant, the TV, the, the online stuff, what do you enjoy and how do you manage it all? Um, you know, I think at the beginning, uh, when I set up Jaconi, it was really difficult because um, I had to be there all of the time. I mean, my hours were so long, the days just kind of bled into one. And we were a seven day operation at that time as well. So I think there was a point where I didn't have a day off for like six months and it was really tough. And at that point, I started becoming very depressed because I really missed the quiet luxury of writing. You know, I, that's what I'd done. I'd been a writer before, I was a journalist. And um, to have yourself and your thoughts, and then suddenly you're in a kitchen and six people are asking you and are in your face all of the time. I found that quite, quite difficult. But now it's lovely because I have a team who are really trained up and who can more or less, you know, without too much input from me. And, and so it gives me that space to be able to create. And I think that's, that's been actually one of the most important things for me is to learn how to delegate as a, as a, as a manager. Because at the beginning, it, it's such an ego thing because you just think only you can do it and only you know how to do it better. And so you end up doing everything yourself and you, you're right for your own back. And now over time, I've learned to hand over things and I just have a better balance and also because I'm not working in the kitchen for the restaurant and develop new ideas like comfort and joy and be creative in the civilized Sunday series and create more and develop new suppliers and all that kind of stuff which I think is really um how do you what do you think I mean we were living through very strange times um, how has lockdown changed the way, if it has, the way you feel about food and restaurants? And how do you think restaurants might emerge at the end of this very strange time? Well, I have a lot of faith and I'm a very glass half full kind of person. And I think for Nadim and I, we always, um, you know, wanted a business and wanted to engage with a business that felt positive and felt part of a community and felt regenerative and at this point now especially we've really had to ask our quest ourselves the question how do we engineer the world around us how do we become part of the solution rather than adding to the problem because of course with covid there was you know issues with food chains and things like that so, so now when we launched uh, comfort and joy and everyone was saying come on what why aren't you doing takeaway you should least be doing takeaway it's another stream of revenue and everything we time with it and we really had values that were non-negotiable so the first one was 100 percent um you know home compostable packaging so with our, our packaging i mean you've seen it you literally put it on your compost sheet and in 90 days it's soil
already cooking with green and energy we have been all our um energy is and um for nish but who are an amazing amazing charity i think you know incredible i mean operationally how they manage what they do is all inspiring uh -huh. and i really wanted to take our partnership with them forward and so someone who who needs one um through them uh, through nishkam swat and um and then just looking at our supplier chain really getting to know where our food is coming from who our producers are are they looking after the environment how you know have do they have the same values as we do so i think our answer to the the pandemic has been comfort and joy and even in in its name we felt very much like this is exactly what people need right now um in terms of obviously we should mention your book again which is our blooms for you now um yeah. in terms of cookery books who are, which ones have been the ones that have inspired you in your life and which ones are there any that you use at home and you still go back to yeah i do have a few favorites so um nigella's how to eat i think was her you know her first book was just the writing and the way it talked about food and the way it connected um you know the human emotions to 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 food i you know just not even just for the recipes alone but just read it in bed and salivate and go to bed dreaming of you know cooking all these wonderful things i think that was an important one in my life and i i remember reading it on the long journey from my weekend job at selfridges uh to to kent you know i just used to read it on the train and that really is right in the way he writes toast was just like mind blowing such a beautiful book it moved me so i remember meeting oh this is riven dish is your biggest fan and then just left me with him like with my jaw hanging <laughs> I love you so much and came that I I wrote to you and I and then I didn't send it to you. <laughs> and you said can you send it to me. So I sent you this talker or something but it was this gushing like how much toast had meant to me and how much his books had been like my companions you know I, to cook and you know I I remember even when I was really young like 14 and i used to go to the cookery section and and i was the person who would like always have books borrowed to my limit and then i couldn't take the extra one home this notebook and it was always and then the other book i love is mother of jaffrey's uh, indian uh, eastern vegetarian cooking it's just a classic and you know she was so ahead of her time and you know it's just it, it doesn't just deal with indian food there's turkish food in there there's chinese food in there i just think she she is just you know incredible incredibly inspiring i feel the same about you about nigel slater i mean he's from wolverhampton and yeah. um, that that makes him a legend in my book um yeah, of course what what's it like uh, cooking for salmon rushdi and uh, he's been to your restaurant quite a few times now right yes yeah so um it's it's wonderful cooking for him because he loves food and he loves to eat and he's really he was interviewed by vogue um about a year ago and he was asked what his favorite restaurant is and he named us and we were just completely like delighted and when i spoke to him afterwards when he came to the restaurant and he said well i just i love chikoni because i always feel at home here and i think that's what it's about it's not just about the food but it's about the hospitality we offer as well he just feels very relaxed so um it's a real compliment and i love cooking for him and now i know all the things he likes and he doesn't like and all his quirks i know what he drinks 
Um, so we have it done. We we and we do that with everyone who comes through through the door. We make we make notes on everyone's personal likes, dislikes, where they like to sit, what they drank last time, whether they enjoyed it or not, whether we offer that to them again. So it's 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 a real pleasure taking care of people. And you know, for us, it is about hospitality. It's not, you know, there's a difference between service and hospitality. Service is the technical. It's the kind of polished cutlery and hot plates and hot food. And hospitality is that intangible thing. It's that selfless, uh, selfness of giving something of yourself. And I think that's what you know the team engage with. They really enjoy it. And watching them last night, you know, they really missed it. And I could see that just to pour people's water, they were like, "Oh, it's so exciting again!" <laughs> you know, it's, it's wonderful to see. There's a great atmosphere in your restaurant, always. Um, I was wondering if you ever had the opportunity to, to expand abroad, like to India or East Africa or America or, or somewhere, where would you like to go? Um, and would you change your menus and how would it feel? I, you know, I've, been, I've thought about that. And I, um, we've been asked and we've been approached and, you know, to various places. And I think, that I would only do it if it made complete sense. Like, I don't want to spend my life on a flight, to, on an airplane, you know, flying back and forth and fixing things. It's not, that's not the fun part of it. But it would have to be, it would have to run by itself and it would have to be a, a sort of simpler version of I, what I do. I have to be so involved with what's going on in the kitchen here that I can't imagine. And maybe it's because I'm a bit of a control freak, seriously, as well. I'd just be like, oh, my God, what's going on there? Like, you know, uh, and with the time difference, I'd probably be up at three in the morning wondering what was happening in Singapore or India or wherever, wherever it was going to be. But, um, you know, never say never if the right project came along with the right people uh, who had our shared values and I think that's the most important thing. That's the biggest le uh, business, um, you know, learning I've had is that always go to business who, uh, with people who really share your values. Yeah, and so, I mean, in terms of the recipes in the book, I feel like I haven't given them enough attention in this uh, <laughs> Instagram live. Which ones would you, if, I had, if you had to pick two of your favorite recipes in this book? What, oh my what, God. Sir. Sorry, okay, I'll, let you, I'll allow you three. Maybe a, a breakfast one, a lunchtime one, and a pudding. What would you pick? Your, I mean, you've got a lovely section of breakfast. Yeah. So I think a breakfast, I would pick the uh, uh, one of two things. It would either be the kimchi paratas, because as a tradition, I've carried that on. My husband was never exposed to that, so now he gets them every Sunday, and I just love that. You know, we don't have the sizzle of bacon, but we have the sizzle of, uh, you know, a paratha frying. And, oh, God, uh, yeah. yeah. I put my little twist on it by putting um, the kimchi in it, which I love, you know, fermented uh, Korean cashews. But then I also really love the the bacon, so the tamarind bacon with the, the fenugreek waffles and slaw, just because it really reminds me of my father. And I love thinking about all the things he loves eating. And I love recreating those moments with him and all the things that he would have loved. So I love that one. Um, um, then the... the I really like recipes that have narrative. So I think one that you've eaten, in fact, we cooked uh, on, on your night at um, uh, your Civilized Sunday at Chikoni was the paneer nudi. Um, and it was this oh, amazing... Oh, that was good. It was really good, right? It really yeah. captured my imagination because it came from this idea or this documentary I'd seen where um, they showed that it, around about 2000, Italy was on, on its knees because they couldn't get the workforce to work on the dairy farms. So they started this immigrant program to get, get Punjabi farmers to come and work with livestock, which they're experts at. And I was just fascinated by their stories and watching these stories of these kids, you know, the kids that they were having growing up, like part Punjabi, part Italian, and how that integration was happening and that the story of those immigrants. 
And so then the idea was that we made homemade paneer, which is very similar to ricotta. And then into that, we grate lots of parmesan and we make these really super light dumplings, which we kind of boil and then fry a little bit. And then we make sag, which is North Indian spinach sauce with cavolo nero, Italian greens, lots more oh, parmesan, God. pine nuts, pickled lemon. <sighs> And, you know, it just that for me is uh, the, you know, a love letter to two uh, cultures integrating. Um, and that's what I love about that recipe. And, um, and then puddings. Oh, my goodness. Um, there are so many puddings that I like in the book. I think the banana cake is a classic. I mean, oh, really? it's not personally to my taste, it's not something I, I love eating, but it's, I can't take it off the menu because people would just riot. I mean, we have people coming in just for the banana cake. We have one in particular who always phones ahead to reserve a slice. We're like, we have plenty. And she's like, I don't care. Just put one aside for me just in case. <laughs> um, and I've never heard, you know, or seen that reaction, the sort of guttural sounds that I hear when people are eating it, like the oohs and the ahs. And I think the reason behind that is that it's just so nostalgic. It's kind of like a sticky toffee pudding, but it's much lighter. Then it has that saltiness from the miso, the sweetness from the, the caramel sauce. The Ovaltine kulfi, which Ovaltine, you know, if, I don't know whether you had it when you used to go to bed, but, or like ever, but Ovaltine is a really nostalgic, uh, powerfully nostalgic um, thing. So I think it hits all those notes with people, which is why it's so popular. God, I'm so hungry now. Jesus. <laughs> um, I should mention a book again, because I think the beginning of the video will be cut off because of our tech problems. But it's uh, Ravinda Bogle's Jaconi. It's out on, out on Bloomsbury soon. The other thing that you're, you it's do really now. well, it's out now, it's out now, right, it's out right now. now. You can have it in your home tomorrow morning if you order it. Um, the other thing you do brilliantly is Bombay mix. People don't realize that Indians actually eat Bombay mix. And I've not looked up at your recipe for it, but it's got quite unusual flavors in it. What, what's in your Bombay mix and what makes it so good? I think that we, I don't know what it is that makes it so good, but I think for me, it's about balancing and, and it's with everything I do, it's about balancing spices. You know, sometimes when you rush things, you burn spices or you undercook them, that's where things taste acrid or you get a funny stomach after eating something like that. But I think for me, it's always been that sort of balancing act of sweet, hot, you know, all those things that pop up in your mouth, you know, different parts of your palate. And I think that's what we try and achieve with our our um, our Bombay mix and or Jaconi mix. And some people have have said it's like crack; they literally can't stop eating it. And I certainly can't have it in the house. Like I make it at the restaurant, but I would never bring it home because I would I would probably take a midnight walk to the kitchen and just eat it. Sitting. <laughs> I had to get my I had to get my nieces to hide it because you sent us I think three boxes. And I, I ate yeah. a whole box as soon as it arrived. And I was like, you know what? This is going to kill me. So she's hidden it somewhere um, where I can't find it. Sadia has sent a, a question. It probably covers similar ground to what we've talked about, but why not? Um, okay. She asks, what was your inspiration behind some of the recipes? Maybe tell us about a recipe we haven't talked about so far. Uh um, let me have a think. My goodness. So the Ponto Scotch Egg of Cultures and... You know, um, there, the Ponto Scotch Egg is essentially in restaurants. You have, you know, a Chinese corn toast, and then you have a British favorite, a, a Scotch Egg. And actually, sometimes when you um, make those things, and I think that's what I really love of doing with my food is well can I erase that border how can I blend that border how can I push this culture sorry the sound is slightly laggy I'm gonna wait a bit I was gonna ask you two questions opposites of the same question first of all what annoys you on the, on the traditional Indian restaurant menu and secondly what are your favorite dishes on other people's Rest, Indian restaurants and what have you missed during lockdown 
I don't know if you got my question there. Uh, what do I not like about uh, Indian menus? Um, I think things have... used to irritate me slightly is the kind of of everything and not honoring the regions that things were coming from i think that has started to happen a lot more um only because you know people are a lot more people are a bit wiser um they're cooking at home a lot more um there's more exposure to what real indian food is all about so i think standards have certainly changed and i for one am really enjoying that to you know people actually cooking uh, food that they would they would eat themselves at home rather than watering something down. What have I missed on other, specifically Indian restaurant menus? No, actually, any restaurant. Any restaurant. Oh, God, there's plenty I've missed. I miss um, things like uh, going to Barafina and just sitting at the counter and just eating such you know, a kind of banquet of good things. They just keep them coming, whether it's ham on or it's a lovely, you know, fried courgette stuffed with cheese or whatever it is, padron peppers, all those kinds of things I've missed. I've missed, uh, what else have I missed? I read there's a, a restaurant in uh, Bethnal Green called Marito, which is run by another woman. And she also cooks Greek food, but in that very, very maternal way. I love her food. Her Greek salad is like her... Uh, her, it's just her, no, the Cretan rusk salad she does is just extraordinary. It's so simple. It's all about the produce and it's so delicious. Um, what else have I missed? Oh, there's so many things now. They, I can't think of them all, but. You know, I've missed martinis. I, I've missed Sorry. martinis. You can't make them at home. You can make martinis at home. I know. Yeah, I. I really miss just the kind of geniality of going out and the hospitality of this. I have to say one place that I really missed a lot in the lockdown and particularly like when Nadim and I were cooking, um, you know, the days that we were cooking for the NHS and stuff, we'd get to the end of the day and be really tired. And often, you know, when we've had a busy service, we just go, right, let's just go and, and have something to eat and lighten our day and have a bit of a date night. And that place is the Wolseley. Like, there is just nothing like mm. it. I just love that place. I love that they always remember you. You know, they always, the service is impeccable. The food is always good. The vanity lighting makes, look, everyone looks beautiful. <laughs> the people watching is incredible. But I just, they're just a class act. I just love everything about them. But I'm obsessed with their lighting. Lighting's so good. <laughs> the, the lighting in your restaurant is very good too. Um, I was going to ask you, I mean, how do you feel, how do you think people feel about going back to restaurants? I mean, some research suggests that only 20% of people feel confident enough to go to pubs and restaurants at the moment. Do you think people are nervous? What's the atmosphere like? What was it like last night? I mean, last night, like I said, we had a lot of our regulars and I think people are just going to be sensible. You know, if you need to, if you've got underlying health conditions and you feel nervous then absolutely stay at home that's what that's why we have comfort and joy and uh, and and you know if you you feel that you're healthy and you know you want to get back and and start seeing people again you know i, I think it's us as as restaurateurs as chefs to be confident and, and show confidence and show people that we are tasty and um and so I think that's what we, we do. And I think there's a lot of like, when you come to Jaconi now, there are fewer tables. There's a lot, lot more signage, but we still have all those lovely things like the romantic lighting and the excellent service and that hospitality. And for us, I think that's God willing, what will get, get us through is our hospitality. That's what we're going to focus on. Just making sure people are having great food, but just above all, a really lovely time. Do you think... Is any things will change about restaurants, like permanently? People are making all sorts of predictions about how COVID is going to change the way people work. Would it change the way that people eat, you think? I don't know. I think, you know, I've done so many of these interviews and I just always say, I wish I had a crystal ball. You know, I wish I could see what was going to happen. But I, I don't. You just 
it's one of those situations that has never happened before and it's just a suck it suck it and see kind of situation and that's what we're doing we're not trying to get panicked about everything i mean even in this time before restaurants open you know it was like 1 meter 2 2 meters 1 meter and i just had to say to the team stop let's just wait for them to make up their minds and then once we have government advice and they've made up their minds then then we can put things into action but until then there's just no it's just a waste of energy worrying about uh, about it and you know as long as you're following government guidelines you're being safe your team are safe your your you know guests safety is your priority obviously the team safety is your priority all of those things as long as you're putting all of that into place then then they shouldn't really be a problem I thank you and like I'm dying to go to restaurants i can't can't wait for my next meal out no and actually there's something quite nice about slightly emptier restaurants or slightly more spaced out restaurants i'm going to come to jaconi soon um final question i mean you've achieved so much i mean it's an incredible really and you're you're the chef's chef you've got a huge amount of respect in the industry and um from your diners too where do you see your career going what do you want to do next is there anything you've not done yet you still want to do well i think um you know i wanted to i've always wanted to write and cook and that is happening a lot more so I'm, i like i said i've been able to carve out a little bit more space uh for the writing which has been really really good for me i think for my mental health as well i think it helps to write um so i've just started a column with the financial times weekend which i'm really excited about um so for that i'm i'm sort of wanting to tell very very human stories about food which really excites me the thought of doing that um and and what else do i want to do i just want to continue being part of positive regenerative business you know that's what i want to do i want to be able to work with like-minded people who inspire me who uh, make me want to create you know jikoni for us now is not just a restaurant it's a little bit more than that it is a a a wider brand you know we have comfort and joy its little sister we we are lonely tail very soon we're looking at doing all sorts of interior stuff as well so there's lots going on all very very creative stuff um which which i like anything creative i just love being involved in in the creative process yeah well i'm very proud of you i think you're doing amazing work um you're incredibly creative and also you're a good person you're like one of the good guys and it's oh, amazing that a good guy is doing well lot. and i just want to say you know like when i was you're not that much older than me but really when i was uh, going through my sort of early years there weren't that many role models and you were one of the people i really looked up to and i was like my god this guy can write and oh, when we first met you know i was just like i read boy with the top knot and i was just completely blown thank you i'm sorry you just cut out at the last second as you were saying something nice about my book i hope you can still see me but i'm um, i'm going to have to end here because it's uh we've hit our time and then apparently we have to end after an hour but thank you for um everyone who tuned in and thank you for your time i'm going to end it here bye ravinda nice chatting